we are in uh, the book of Acts, and we're in Acts chapter 7, and we're going to pick it up where we left off last time, and we're going to pick it up at verse 51. And the context here is Stephen was giving his defense in Acts chapter 7, and everything was going fairly well in his defense, but then he got to verse 51, and he says, you men who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, and are always resisting the Holy Spirit, you are doing just as your fathers did. Which one of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? They killed those who had previously announced the coming of the Righteous One, whose betrayers and murderers you have now become. You who received the law as ordained by angels, and yet did not keep it. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the quick, and they began gnashing their teeth at him. And being full of the the Holy Spirit, he gazed intently into heaven, and he saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens open, and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice, and covered their ears, and rushed at him with one impulse. And they had driven him, when they had driven him out of the city, they began stoning him. And the witnesses laid aside their robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. They went on stoning Stephen as he called on the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And having said this, he fell asleep. Okay, so remember back earlier in, in that chapter, and actually in the end of chapter 6, it said that in verse 15, and fixing their gaze on him, that was the council, and fixing their gaze on him, all who were sitting in the council saw his face like the face of an angel. And we had discussed that here this man had been wrongly accused, and when one is wrongly accused, Either they become despondent and they kind of curl up and, or they, they come with a, a, a vehement, vehement defense. But not in his case. Neither of the typical responses was seen in Stephen. They just saw his face like the face of an angel. And now, it says in verse 54 of Acts chapter 7, When they heard this, they were cut to the quick, and they began gnashing their teeth at him. So here is the council, and they're so angry that they're gnashing their teeth at him. This means they can't control their anger. There's this uncontrollable anger that is filling them. There's this rage that's that's stirring up within them. And Stephen's response is... In verse 55, being full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed intently into heaven and he saw saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. So as they are raging, as the council is enraged, so enraged that they're grinding their teeth, this man is so full of the Holy Spirit, he's just gazing up into heaven. He's not even looking at the council. He's not looking down. He's not enraged. He's not scared. He's just looking up into heaven. Remember, the filling of the Holy Spirit comes on many occasions and on repeated occasions. Different than the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which occurred on the day of their salvation. This filling of the Holy Spirit came on certain occasions for certain tasks that they were being called to. He had been filled with the Holy Spirit for this very task. And what about the words that Jesus had said? That when you get brought before councils, when you get brought before synagogues and rulers, don't worry about what you will say. I will give you the words to speak in that hour. So God had given him the words that he needed. Remember, this wasn't a legal brief that he prepared. But just because Jesus says that he will be with us, does not mean that everything here on earth is going to go smoothly. It's not a contradiction in Jesus' view. 
to say, I will be with you when you stand before councils, when you stand before synagogues and they drag you before leaders. And then to have this rage coming against him to the point where they're stoning him to death. There's no contradiction in in the mind of Jesus. Where he says, I will be with you. So Jesus being with us doesn't mean that everything is going to go well. Life is full of problems. And there's many things that come upon the believer as well as the unbeliever. But... Stephen's response is so different. He's just gazing up into heaven and he saw the glory of God. To see the glory of God was described in the Old Testament as the Shekinah glory. So they would talk about they saw the glory of God. This is what he sees in this moment. You have a group right here that is raging and frothing with anger and murder in their hearts. And you have one person who is three feet away from them and enjoying the presence of God. Look at that picture. What does that mean for us? That when the world is scared and enraged and angry and bitter, and all the things that can happen in the world, Jesus said, you can be very different. If you want to, you can be very different. Stephen looks up, he sees the glory of God, and he sees Jesus standing at the right hand of God. This standing at the right hand of God is most unusual. In the Old Testament, in in the book of Psalms, there is prophecy of standing at the right hand of God. In the New Testament, there are several references, I'm sorry, there's sitting at the right hand of God. In the New Testament, there are several references to Jesus sitting at the right hand of the Father. In in the book of Hebrews in particular, many references to Jesus sitting. The sitting giving the sense that he has completed his work. The task that the Father has sent him to do, he has done. And he is seated at the right hand of the Father. But in this case, he is standing at the right hand of the Father. It is as if Jesus himself has stood up from his throne, which is next to his Father's throne... And he's ready to receive the saint. He's ready to receive Stephen. It's a very different picture that we have now. Jesus, standing at the right hand of the Father, he stands at the right hand of the Father to receive the saints. He says, Father, just a moment. I need to receive this one. And he stands up. And Stephen sees this. He sees Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father, frothing and anger and murder in the heart, and three feet away, a man beholding the glory of God. This is the picture of what we can be as believers if we will so allow the Holy Spirit to fill us. It is very easy to be a believer and to froth and rage just like the world does. It is very easy to get drawn into this. And the Holy Spirit says, you know, there is a better way here. I could keep it so that you have your mind in perfect peace. So that when the world is worried about terrorist attacks and things occurring and all these things happening, you can really have perfect peace. It doesn't mean that everything is going to go well from the world's perspective. But from the perspective of Jesus, he's standing, caring, and ready to receive, should that occasion be needed. And then it says in 55 that he saw this, he gazed intently and he saw this. And then in verse 56 he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. So now he speaks it. So first he First he he sees it, and now he speaks it. He says, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and covered their ears and rushed at him with one impulse. Absolutely out of control, people. 
Remember, these aren't, you know, the, the, these aren't people who live on the street. This is the council. This is the council members, the Jewish leaders. You have 71 members in the Sanhedrin. We don't know how many of them partook in this, but there had to be a majority. So, so you, you had to have at, at least 35. And these are dignified men. You think men of dignity, men who have position in the world, are not subject to this sort of response? They really are. There's professors in the university that can act like this. When the enemy so fills the heart because we give no control, no place to God, it is amazing how violent and angry we can become. These were the most educated men among the Jews. These were the leaders and the teachers. So education isn't the thing that keeps us from falling into this. If they had only been educated, they wouldn't have done this. No. These men were quite educated. They were scholars in all that was known in that day. You can have a totally different response. In verse 58, when they had driven him out of the city, they began stoning him. So remember, all executions were done outside the city. And we discussed how they had lost the, they had lost the right to, for the council, for the Sanhedrin, to uh, uh, have a man executed. And that's why Jesus had to be turned over to the Roman government. But there were two things. One was they were allowed to protect their temple with execution. The other thing that, they, they were, that may have happened is that uh, uh, when Pilate had been taken out of office and before the new procurator came, there was a one-year period, and it may have happened during this period. And they took him out of the city, and the witnesses laid aside the robes at the feet of a young man named Saul, and they went on stoning him. So you see, re remember now all of a sudden they're bringing some sign of legitimacy to this, at least in their own minds. They're having the witnesses throw the first stone. So those who came forward as false witnesses were the ones who were throwing the first stones. But remember, we had gone through the trial. And what had to happen, according to the Sanhedrin in their own Mishnaic law, was that they could never have an execution within 24 hours of the trial and the condemnation. They had to wait 24 hours at least for more information to come in. But none of that is taking place. They are violating rule after rule. <clears throat> Remember, there could have been no show of emotion by the one leading the council. But that's not the case here. And so they have the witnesses come forth. They lay their robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. So this Saul is Paul the Apostle. Later going to be called Paul the Apostle. Now, the, the idea is that this is a young man, so you think maybe he's 18 or 19. Not necessarily. This term, young man, was used for any man in Israel that was under the age of 40. So he may have been 39, but he was still called a young man. So we don't know what his age was. Maybe he was 20. But that he was readily, right after that, given such authority that he was given in, in Acts chapter 8, there, there's the presumption then that he probably wasn't 20 years old because he was given such authority. We don't know how old he was, but we do know that he was probably under 40 because this term was used for a person under 40, a man under 40. So they lay aside the robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And they went on stoning Stephen as he called on the Lord and he said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. So he knows that this is the end. And he says, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. This is a beautiful picture of what the death of a saint can be like. We all fear death, but this is the picture of what death can be in the Lord. Verse 60, Then falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And having said this, he fell asleep. So he, tells, he asks God, don't hold this sin against them. The very same thing that Jesus had prayed from the cross, he prays. And then he says, when he said this, he fell asleep. This term, 
fell asleep. This term of sleeping is very different than death. It was never used for just anybody in the Scriptures. It was used for the saints. Jesus views the death of the saints as a period of time of sleeping. There is no cessation of spirit or soul activity in death, according to Jesus. There is a cessation of physical activity, and he calls it sleep. Look in, in, uh, keep your finger there, but just look in uh, Matthew chapter 27. After the, 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 uh, um, the death of Jesus, there was a resurrection of some of the saints. It says in Matthew chapter 27, verse 51, And behold, the veil on the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split, and the tombs were open, and many of the bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. So he uses the same terminology for the saints, for those in Israel who had loved God and worshipped Him. They were raised at the crucifixion of Jesus. And they came out of their tombs. And it says that they had been asleep. So the same term he used, the scriptures used for Stephen being asleep is what these saints were. Look in in Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5. The same terminology used by Jesus. Not using the word death, but using the word sleep for those who are precious to him. In Mark chapter 5, we'll pick it up at verse 35. And while he was still speaking, they came from the house of the synagogue official, saying, Your daughter has died. Why trouble the teacher anymore? But Jesus, overhearing, overhearing what was being spoken, said to the synagogue official, Do not be afraid any longer. Only believe. And he allowed no one to accompany him, except Peter and James and John and the, bro- the brother of James. And they came to the house of the synagogue official, And he saw the commotion and the people loudly weeping and wailing. And entering in, he said to them, Why make a commotion and weep? The child has not died, but is asleep. They began laughing at him, but putting them all out, he took along the child's father and mother and his own companions and entered into the room where the child was. And taking the child by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kum, which translated means little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl got up and began to walk, for she was twelve years old, and immediately they were, com- and, and immediately they were completely astounded. And he gave them strict orders that no one should know about this, and he, and he said that something should be given to her to eat. The same terminology Jesus used. He said, she's asleep. This is a precious one. This is one that means something to me. When a believer dies, God views it as a state of sleep. It is not the end. It is not the end. And it's not even the end at that moment. It is the end of their physical body activity. But that will come back one day in the resurrection. But the soul and the spirit activity does not stop. And that's why it says of Stephen, he fell asleep. And you see the same terminology that was used of Lazarus. He told his disciples that Lazarus has fallen asleep. And they thought that he meant literal sleep. And then he finally, so that he could explain it to them, he says, Lazarus has died. In your mind, he's died. But he referred to it as sleep. And it says that of believers in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, if we as believers don't learn to ask the forgiveness of God, we will end up getting weak and sick and sleeping. So as believers, when we fail to walk in God's forgiveness, by not asking Him to forgive us, by not walking in this that He puts forth in our hearts to remind us, and we go about this in a cavalier way and say, oh, it doesn't really matter. And He says, it's because of this, you take the Lord's Supper without examining yourself, it's because of this that there are many weak and sick and a number sleep. And so because of this, some believers don't like to take the Lord's Supper because they say, I don't want to bring this upon myself. Well, how much more would be the penalty if we refuse to even take the Lord's Supper? Because He commands us 
let a man examine himself, and so let him eat and drink. But he says, if we don't do this, we too will sleep. Meaning it's not the end. We'll get weak and sick. We may even have our physical bodies die. But it's not the end for the believer. And it says that when we do ask God to forgive us, we even allay judgment and discipline. In other words, we can fend off discipline from the Lord that's coming our way if we learn to ask forgiveness. It says because when you do this, when you examine yourself, you're not judged along with the world. And he says that, that you'll be disciplined, but we can avoid the discipline even if we learn to walk in forgiveness and asking God to forgive us. This term sleep that he says of Stephen, he says, says this isn't the end. Jesus stands and receives him into heaven. This is the picture that we have of Stephen. Now let's pick it up in Acts chapter 8, verse 1. Acts chapter 8, verse 1. Saul was in hearty agreement with putting him to death. Okay, so Saul was in hearty agreement. Saul wasn't just standing there and, you know, watching the cloaks. You know, you wonder how corrupt was the area that they couldn't even put their cloak aside for five minutes to kill a guy without worrying that somebody was going to pick their pockets. That they have to assign a person to watch the coats. But it says Saul was in hearty agreement. That means not just agreement. The word there is hearty agreement. He was like, yes. Yes. He's just pumping his fist. Yes. Kill him. You see the anger in these people. And Stephen's response is very different. Even Paul was in hearty agreement, pumping his fist, and being encouraged by every blow coming upon Stephen. And God gives the opportunity for a very different response. This is the different response that he calls us to, is the response that Stephen had. Look in, in Luke chapter 21. Jesus calls us to have this type of response even when the world is perishing. In Luke chapter 21, verse 25, it says, There will be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars and on the earth dismay among the nations in perplexity at the roaring of the sea and the waves. Men fainting from fear and the expectation of the things which are coming upon the world, for the power of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud and power and great glory. But when these things begin to take place, straighten up, lift up your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. Look at the response he calls the believer to. The world is so distraught, because the end is coming. Things aren't working right anywhere, anymore in the world. There's signs in the sun, moon, and stars. There's dismay among the nations and perplexity because of the way the oceans are. The whole world is dismayed. And men are fainting from fear and expectations of the things that are coming. We don't know what the world has in store for us. We don't know. Only God knows the future. But come what may, Jesus said, straighten up, lift up your head because your redemption draws near. You don't have to be fainting along with the world and saying, what's going to come of me? What's going to happen now? Look at the way the world is. Look at the way the terrorists are. Look at the way that Jesus says, straighten up, lift up your head for your redemption draws near. This is the response that he calls us to. Something very different from the world. Stop cowering. Stop crawling up and sucking your thumb and crying. Straighten up. Lift up your head for your redemption draws near. Turn to, to Psalm 91. Psalm 91. The same sort of idea that when the world has one response, the believer is to have another response. Psalm 91, reading from verse 1. 
He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For it is He who delivers you from the snare of the trapper and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with His pinions and under His wings you may seek refuge and His faithfulness is a shield and a bulwark. You know, many of the things that hit us in life are not the catastrophic end of the world type thing. Nevertheless, they can shake us to our very core. They are the death of a loved one. They are deep financial troubles. Whether we got into those ourselves or we got into those because of disaster that occurred where somebody became terribly ill or something. There are other problems that come. Loss of a job. Man has a family and children, and he gets laid off. And there's serious crying out to the Lord. And the Bible reminds us in verse 1, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. You will abide in His shadow if you dwell in His shelter. You dwell in His shelter. You learn how to have a relationship that's close to Him. You know, the secret is that so few believers ever learn what it is to enjoy the shelter of the Almighty. So few believers know what it is to come daily before Him and enjoy His presence. And what He is saying is, if you've learned to enjoy His presence, you're going to be just shadowed by Him. He is not going to leave you. He is not going to forsake you. He says, I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Look what he says. He says, say it to the Lord. I will say to the Lord, my refuge, my fortress, my God in whom I trust. You take that word and you speak it forth. God already knows who he is. This is for us. This reminds us that God is my refuge. He is my fortress. He is my God in whom I trust. You know, whenever I start doubting, Shireen has this enormous faith which comes through. And she just starts quoting scripture. You know, and just five minutes of just pure quotation of scripture. And I'm again a roaring lion. She just confesses this word of God to me. You take this word and you begin to confess this word. He says, I will say to the Lord, my refuge, my fortress, my God in whom I trust. It's not God saying it. He says, you say it. You say it. You remind yourself who God is, that He is your refuge, He is your fortress, He is the one in whom you can trust. And you learn to call upon Him daily. It is not just for the time when the world is ending or for when you get laid off with a job. You learn to to call upon Him. Lord, as I go to work this day and I try to solve this problem, Father, I cry out to You for great insight. You are my refuge, my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Lord, as I go into this difficult meeting, oh, how my flesh wants to lose its temper. But God, you are my refuge, my fortress, my God in whom I trust. And then the scriptures say that the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the entire earth to strongly support those whose heart is completely His. So you cry out, you say these words, and God goes, whoa. Do you hear what he just said? And he dispatches this group of angels to go with you. And he empowers you by the Holy Spirit. And you say, this is fictitious. It is not. It is not. It is the Word of God. This is more true than the silly little things in our own mind. This is the truth of the Word of God. This is where we are. God, I have to go on this business trip. I don't know how I'm going to get through this thing. The things that are before me, 
God, what shall I do? You are my refuge, my fortress, my God in whom I trust. And God fills. As we take this word of God and put it in our hearts, and then what happens is exactly what happened to Stephen. The Holy Spirit fills for that occasion. Being filled with the Holy Spirit, he looked up and he saw. God gave him a vision of what happens in these sort of situations. Jesus rises up from his throne and stands up. This is what happens. And so few of us as believers will ever do this. Will ever call on God and say, God, do this in my life. You're my refuge, my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For it is He who delivers you from the snare of the trapper and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with His pinions. Under His wings you may seek refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a bulwark. You will not be afraid of the terror by night or of the arrow that flies by day, of the pestilence that starts in the darkness or of the destruction that lays waste at noon. So much of our consumption is because of fear. He says, you will not be afraid. If you do this, you will not be afraid. If you do this, He promises, you will not be afraid. That fear that can sometimes so grip your heart and you feel like you can't go forward anymore. He says, it will grip your heart no longer if you learn to do this. No amount of education will bring you this. This is given by the Holy Spirit who comes from God as we pray and ask Him. Jesus said, you don't receive because you do not ask. Will we ask of Him? Stephen was given a supernatural scene in heaven of what happens. Though we don't see, yet we are to believe. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the truth of your word. Lord, thank you for what you have demonstrated with with the life of Stephen how you received him into glory, but how his heart was so different in the midst of that. And Father, I pray for these young people that you so fill their hearts with truth that they would learn to cry out to you. They would learn to cry out to you as Stephen did. Father, that they would learn to cry out, God, my refuge, my fortress, my God in whom I trust, and that you would so free them from the fear that can easily grip them. Father, I pray that you so fill them to overflowing with the truth of your word. Father, that they would learn to enjoy you, to enjoy your presence. Father, so fill them, I pray. And I commit them to you, asking your grace to abound. In the name of Jesus. Amen.